afternoon, Aspergers Legion. Welcome back to the Aspergers Growth YouTube channel with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, the Aspie next door. Hey, <laughs> terrible, absolutely terrible. Today we are going to be talking about autism language. We're not talking about the general difficulties around language for many autistic people. That would be a separate video. So if you're thinking about that, maybe maybe go check out a different video. The reason why I'm putting this list together, the reason why I'm doing this video, is because I've received a lot of messages from people who are autistic, either late diagnosed or, or just getting into the social media realm that we have. And they go on to these places trying to do good work, trying to raise autism awareness, trying to share their experience, but they use some very outdated terms. They use some terms that people don't like, and for a lot of them, it can cause them to be the subject of hate, of bullying online. You know, some of these things will be an absolute lifesaver for you. I'm going to be talking about ableism, functioning labels, aspies, but we're also going to be talking about identity, first language, stimming, and neurodiversity. All these things are what I deem to be important things to understand, important concepts to know the background behind, uh, important things to know if you're, if you're thinking of getting into the world of autism. This is the video for you, and we're going to be talking about those key things. At its core definition, ableism is the discrimination of disabled people from able-bodied people. Now this is a term that has generally stemmed from uh, disability rights, you know, things to do with physical disabilities, but it has in more modern terms been applied to autism. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen a lot more use of the word ableism lately. It's not something that I generally use, but it is something that I've seen more of. Ableism is rooted, rooted in the idea that disabled people need fixing, that a disability defines a person. These are two common examples or common ways of thinking about what, what ableism is beyond that sort of core definition. Examples of ableism could be not complying to disability rights, not making events, places accessible to disabled people, and there are a lot of ways that, that ableism can be used as a term. Segregating disabled people into different schools and just outright mocking people for being disabled. These are all things that would, would come under the ableism category and it is not a good thing. Let me make that clear. It's not a good thing. It's not like we need to promote ableism. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very much the opposite. We don't want it. I guess one of the more suitable examples and possibly a little bit extreme example of ableism would be the past history of eugenics. Now, if you don't know, eugenics was basically a movement to rid the population of unfavorable genes. You're going to see these little bad boys out a few times because I cannot say them without them, or else they'll just be quoted in a very unfriendly way to my channel. <laughs> eugenics really focused around ridding, ridding the world of disability. I mean, it's something that, that has been employed in history um, in a particular atrocity that I'm not going to talk about. I mean, as with any social-based term, it's always a little bit ambiguous. You know, the, the lines are a bit blurred. Um, ableism can be expressed in many, many different ways, as other autistic advocates have posted on. Uh, especially on Instagram, things that I've seen. I guess a more nuanced and known about example would be parading autistic people for tear-jerking content. You know, I, I call it awe, it's awe content, you know? 
something that people can go, oh, that's so nice, that's so heartwarming and wholesome. It happens a lot, but the, the, the thing is, is that <laughs> autism is only really paraded like that, unless a celebrity is talking about it. In some ways, maybe positive, a lot of ways, probably negative. Functioning labels. Yes, everybody's favorite topic. Oh, there has been so many controversies online, so much hate and so much bullying and fighting and all sorts over these labels. Basically, functioning labels has come out of, you know, the medical realm, the, the psychological, analytical realm. It's something that is rooted in science and it's generally thought that putting people into these categories allows people in, in social care and people who are doing like psychology and, and people like OTs and stuff like that so that they can group people and figure out how much support a person would need. Which I guess for, for an outsider's perspective, it, you know, what's the problem with that? But the problem is, <laughs> as, as you, will, you will hear in many of these points, there is a difficulty when science clashes with social progression. Turns out not many people like being called low functioning. It's a little bit degrading, you know? No one wants to be called low functioning. And on the flip side of that coin, no one wants to be called high functioning because that person may be dealing with a lot, a lot of stuff. They may have a lot of the negative aspects of, of being autistic. And so saying that they're high functioning sort of puts a label on them. It sort of minimizes their, their negative experiences and reduces people's urgency in supporting them, which is a really big problem. For me, personally, it has been a little bit of a difficult topic because not using functioning labels sort of excludes, sort of creates a bottleneck for, for people wanting to learn more about autism. It sounds very complex <laughs> for, for an onlooker. You know, like if you're just getting into, I don't know, learning about EDS, you've got no idea what it is. And someone comes at you and says, you should not call this this and, and that and some people people have short attention spans these days <laughs> like um if something's too complex they might just click off it maybe just look somewhere else for, for information on it and if it's still too complex they may just give up altogether and also there has been a recent change in the diagnostic statistical manual i believe it was around 2014 maybe 2015 they removed a lot of the subgroupings of an autism diagnosis. You may have heard of things like Asperger's syndrome, PDD, NOS, childhood disintegrative disorder, uh, classic autism. Those are kind of terms that, that used to be used for people uh, and generally distinguish different groups. If I was going to apply labels for anybody who, who doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I'm not doing it. But generally, Asperger's would be, you know, sort of more high functioning and classic autism would be sort of more low functioning, requiring a lot of support and such. The difficulty around that is that how do you, how do you subgroup people? Like, my experience of autism is, is very vastly different to someone who is in full-time care, who is non-verbal, who can't communicate their wants and needs to, to a very high degree. Um, have poor motor functioning, have a lot of disruptive um, or aggressive behaviours. You know, there's a lot of differences between my experience and um, someone who would be considered to have maybe classic autism. And so there's a lot of tension around that. It's important not to talk about it, because if you talk about it in any way and you don't explain what your point and you don't eloquently explain it, then you are at risk of people getting upset at you and possibly harassing you for it. I am indeed putting myself at risk for, for hate for this, but I think it's important to sort of highlight where, where these things come from and um, why you shouldn't use these labels in modern day society. Numero three, Mr. Aspie. <laughs> Aspie World. 
How are you doing, Dan? I hope you're watching this. Anyway, <laughs> Aspie is at its very root, it is a shorthand bogda. What's the right word? I can't even remember the right word for it. Aspie is a shortened word for a person who identifies as having Asperger's syndrome. See, I said having. God damn it. <laughs> Could never get it right. It's the word play is real. It's sometimes a struggle. A person who identifies as being of the Asperger's variety. Yes, that is an Aspie. It is a shortened word and it has been used for a long time, but very recently it has been not been used. Partly that's because of the DSM, as I've said. It's no longer a thing that people diagnose, which is annoying. Uh, but if you have been diagnosed with Asperger's prior to this, this change, then you still keep that diagnosis. Just a little bit of an info tip for you there. Basically, the, the reason why this has been removed, the word Aspie is, is perhaps not the best term, is because people relate Asperger's syndrome to its creator. Hans Asperger, of course. The Nazi scientist. People don't like to be to, to have a word that's associated with him. No, you know, they don't want it. Which is, I guess, on some levels understandable. But I like the word Aspie. You know, I think in some ways we've reclaimed the word the, the Asperger syndrome, we've reclaimed it as Aspie. You know, I, I don't see it as a problem. To be honest, I do get people messaging me saying that. Either my documentary Asperger's in Society or Asperger's Growth is a little outdated and um, triggering, as some people have mentioned. But to be honest, I mean, it's. I think it's, this one is a lot to do with personal opinion. There's no 100% consensus on any of these things. Um, but Aspie is, you know, it's kind of in the middle. If you are starting up a new advocacy profile or social media or account or YouTube account or podcast, Maybe don't use the word Aspie, use Aughty, something like that. Um, but don't go out of your way to change anything, you know? It's it's not, not a bad thing, really. Number four. Numero four. Yeah, didn't see that coming, did you? Identity first language. What is it? What does it mean? The best way to explain identity first language is to give you an example. A person likes to be called or likes to be referred to as an autistic person. Autistic being the label, um, person being the second thing. Terrible explanations here on the Asperger's Growth Channel, but at least I'm consistent with them. <laughs> identity first language is as I've said with all of these, uh, I guess more of a relatively new thing. The opposite of that, identity second language, a person with autism, is kind of rooted in a lot of outdated views on what autism is. Generally you have two models, two general models, I mean you could get into the specifics of it, but there are two general models, one being the medical model, a disability, uh, something that is not desirable and that causes people to have bad lives, something that causes them disability. On the other side you have something called the social model of disability, which is about how a different person interacts with the environment. For example, the social structures that we have in place in schools, in workplaces, in in, term, in social norms, in, in any aspect of society, it's not built for autistic people, that there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of understanding to be done. And until we have cracked down on that and got to work on it and improved things, we cannot fully say that autism is disabling. I mean, it's definitely not disabling, uh, full stop. You know, quite ironically, that is a, a black and white approach to it uh, because there is, there's a lot of things that are good and negative about autism. So you can't really put it into one category like that and, and call it a disability and say that it needs to be improved or cured. God, I hate that word. If you, if you tie something so dramatically to your personality, 
like autism, you know, it's a, con a condition of the mind, a difference, something that impacts your brain's development, something that changes how you feel and changes how you interact with the world and experience the world. That is, in, in many ways, a, a very staple part of who someone is. I guess a good comparison point would be my podcast with Sarah Hope, um, who is physically disabled as, as well as being autistic. And she talks about the, the, the differences in that sort of person-first language. She can imagine herself being an able-bodied person, um, someone who could walk. But she can't imagine herself not being autistic. You know, if you took a pill that remo that erased every shred of autism in your genetic code and your being and your all of that other stuff, um, you would be a completely different person. You would not be the same person. To, to, to many outsiders looking at this, it's like, it can be viewed as a sort of a negative thing. Why are you associating this part of yourself with your disability or something bad and, you know, don't put a label on yourself kind of thing. But it's not about putting a label on yourself. It's about acknowledging that being autistic is part of you. I think a person's propensity to, to use this person first language very much bases on their experience, their exposure to advocacy, their exposure to social media, the type of groups that they're in, the, the type of person that they are, whether they experience a lot of the more negative sides of autism or not. There are a lot of factors that go into this and not every single per autistic person wants to use that language. Some may want to be referred to a person with autism. They don't tie it to their personality. They see it as a struggle and a barrier. It's not something that I do. I'm an autistic person. I like being autistic, um, but I know that some people don't. And I have friends who don't, and that they're not into this social progression stuff. Numero five. I'm lifting up your hand right now. You are moving towards the like button. You are pressing your finger on the light button. Oh God. Oh crap. Skit gone wrong. <laughs> Ow, God damn it. Number five, <laughs> stimming. We all love stimming. We all love talking about stimming especially in the autistic community. And it's a brilliant thing. For anybody who doesn't know, stimming is, at its very basis, repetitive actions or words or noises that autistic people do to soothe themselves, to reduce anxiety, to reduce stress for stimulation. Anything along those lines, that's what stimming's for. Now, in the past, Stimming has had a negative rap, especially among parents and scientists and organisations. Stimming is something that people don't want. But the reason why people don't want it is because it looks weird. <laughs> Pretty much, it's not socially acceptable behaviour to do these movements. Um, completely ignoring the fact that people who aren't autistic do these movements. They just do different socially acceptable movements like tapping your leg or picking your teeth or your neck biting your nails or chewing gum or fidgeting or anything along those lines, tapping your fingers. We all do things to soothe ourselves when we're, we're feeling anxious and stressed. Um, but due to our different sensory profiles, you know, we tend to be more hypo and hypersensitivity sensitive in, in different areas. And so we respond better to stims that incorporate that. For example, when I was younger, I loved to spin around in a circle. I still love to go on fairground rides. I can't spin around in a circle on one leg now that I'm six foot three. Um, it's very dangerous for me. And uh, if I was to fall, I would definitely injure myself. 
you know, I, I love going in the car. I love that motion. It, it relaxes me. And stimming can be different things to different people. It's a very individual thing. From the general consensus um, in the autistic community, stimming is something that is promoted. And thank God it is, because in a lot of cases, stims, in, in the large majority of cases, are not harmful to the autistic person, and they are not harmful to other people. They may look a little bit strange to someone who's not who's not seen them before, and they may be sort of a, a, a magnet for discrimination and bullying. But as a thing, as an action, as a behaviour, the only thing wrong with it in most people's eyes is that it looks strange. And is that really something to, to sacrifice the ability to emotionally regulate yourself and to um, explore perhaps your, your dulled or highly sensitive senses? I don't think so. I think this this whole movement of incorporating stimming as, as part of a, an autistic existence, part of something that you talk about and something that you share, we tend to have a lot of social norms, things that are acceptable and things that are not so acceptable. And those sometimes have, have no sort of basis in logic. You know, it's all created. And unless there is a logical reason for it, you know, for example, I guess a social behaviour like hurting someone, obviously not a great thing. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's not good. We should we should disapprove of that. That's that's what that's the uh, the core message of the Asperger's Grip Channel: no hurting people. Um, but stimming does not harm anyone. Lastly, let's talk about neurodiversity. Sort of imagining uh, SpongeBob when he, he makes a rainbow of his hands. You know that gif. You know you know what I'm talking about if you watch Spongy, SpongeBob. Neurodiversity is something that is thought to be relatively new, you know, uh, a recent social progression. But actually it does have a small amount of history to it. Particularly Hans Asperger uh, was one of the first people to talk about neurodiversity and in some ways bring the public awareness to this. Many of the kids that he worked with um, had a lot of redeeming qualities, a lot of positives, that quite often balance themselves with some of the negatives. But it's, it, I guess it's been more popularised in, in recent times as a concept, as a, as a form of diversity. Neurodiversity is the viewpoint that deficits in the human brain are actually not deficits. They are just a natural part of human diversity. Diversity among the brains. It covers everything from dyspraxia to dyscalculia to autism, ADHD, Tourette's. I mean, I've got a little bit of a thing laid out here. These are some of the common things. You know, you've got bipolar up there. Um, I don't know if bipolar should be up there, actually. Probably not. I don't know. I'll have to recheck on that. But generally, um, autism and ADHD seem to be the, the, the core parts of neurodiversity, or at least uh, from what I've seen on social media and what I've, what I've read about. Neurodiversity is a good thing, and it wholesomely accepts the view that many, many autistic people have about autism, that they like it, that it comes, it's, it's a very grey approach to it, you know, it comes with a lot of negatives, it comes with a lot of positives, and it's just about adjusting your existence to uh, an autistic existence to have a fruitful, good life. And that's what neurodiversity is about. It's about encouraging people to work with people of different brains. It's about incorporating them into social circles, about improving things, about um, making adjustments, about learning more um, about how the human experience can differ from person to person. One of the things that um, Professor Baron Cohen talked about was we have this concept of biodiversity, you know, the diversity among plants and animals. You know, we, we don't expect all plants to behave the same, nor do we need them to behave the same. And in many cases, it's an asset. It's an adding to the gene pool. It's 
they bring their own good qualities, you know, some of them growing good weather. And, I mean, it's a very, it's a very tedious, not tedious, very tenuous link. People who are diverse, neurodiverse, for example, autistic people, could call themselves neurodivergent. Now, I understand where the word comes from, but it just makes me think of that divergent film, <laughs> you know, with those angsty teens, you know, getting lovey-dovey with each other and finding themselves and fitting into society. I don't like the word, so I don't use it, but I know a lot of people do. The opposite of that, someone who wouldn't be considered to be autistic or have ADHD or etc., would be called neurotypical. And that's a word that I do use because there is no real word other than non-autistic. So it's nice to have that, that extra little word there. In some ways, it is a positive consequence of adopting that social model of disability rather than the general medical model of disability that has been applied to autism more often in the past. Neurodiversity is a movement, it's a statement, it's something to be encouraged, it's something to be spread, and it is an important thing to learn about. In society, we, we place a high value these days on promoting diversity. We promoted it in many different areas, but one thing that um, hasn't really received the same treatment, hasn't really seen the same exposure is neurodiversity. As I've said, with the, the quality of life and bullying and isolation and suicide and de depression and mental health statistics that surround autism, it is really important to tackle down on this and neurodiversity is, is the heading. If you want a list of, of everything that's included in neurodiversity, I'm sure you could find, you know, with a quick Google search. Um, but yeah, I hope that clears it up. Okay, so that is the long list of terms of language that you may want to get acquainted with. If you are thinking of understanding autism, you're thinking of doing any work to do with autism or advocacy work, maybe you're late diagnosed yourself and you haven't quite got to grips with the, the modern lingo. It's important to get these things, <laughs> to know these things, because um, some people can be very hateful. And as I've said, there have been cases of bullying um, on accounts of using the wrong words. And that is something that has become more prominent in, in our society. You know, people, uh, I guess, looking at the, the surface language rather than the intention and the, and the meaning behind things. So I hope that, that that clears things up for you. Please feel free to, to get in contact, to message me on Instagram, put a comment down below, um, any place like that, send me an email, aspergesgriff at gmail.com. I will try and reply as quickly as possible. If you need any more help on it, and a lot of people have the same issues about certain uh, topics, I shall make a video on it and try and explain them. I just don't want bad things to happen to good people. And the, social, the, the current state of social media and the social progression is sometimes very harsh on people. You know, I, need to stop, I need to round these things up. Thank you very much for watching. Let's hit the boom again. I have many videos on autism and mental health, but I also have a podcast that has recently been gaining a lot of traction called the 40 Oti Podcast, and you can find it on Spotify, Apple, or Google Podcasts. You can always follow my social medias, at Asperger's Growth, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And as I said, if you want any more information, get in contact on my email. Stay cool, stay fresh, remember to shower, remember to hydrate yourself. All important things to uh, a person's life, to a person's reputation, to their health. Do them. And I'm going to stare crazy because of these ring lights. Okay, I'm finished now. I'm finished now, though. I'm finished. <laughs>
Ooh. 